Hello everyone, I'm Robin Howlett. I am a certified matrimonial attorney with the Weinberger Divorce and Family Law Group. Um, doing this a long time, certainly understand and recognize that divorce can be very challenging under many circumstances. Um, what we're gonna talk about today is, situa is a situation when you are divorcing a spouse who is a narcissist. Uh, conflict in divorce can spiral and negatively impact not only you, um, but also your children for years to come. So it's important um, to address these issues early on. There are, in fact, concrete steps that you can take to safely get through your divorce from a narcissist. Uh, you can protect yourself, your children, and uh, start a new future with your sanity and peace of mind intact. And uh, that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, um, this presentation that we are offering today contains general information. Uh, we are not providing legal advice, um, and we ask that you have uh, and direct any specific questions uh, to an attorney. And uh, because certainly an attorney is the best person to guide you and answer you uh, with any specific questions that you may have. So we're going to get started, and the presentation is Divorcing a Narcissist, and there are five strategies for getting through it. And I'm happy to announce uh, our guest who's returning here uh, to speak with us here at WLG, Weinberger Divorce and Family Law Group. And we have a marriage and family therapist, Virginia Gilbert. So hello, Virginia. Hi, Robin. Thank you for having me back. It's nice to be here. Absolutely. So nice to work with you. Um, so today, Virginia is going to shed, shed some insight into how to keep yourself healthy and sane during your divorce from your narcissist spouse. Um, it's going to be the key to having a bright and healthy future for you and your children. Um, I will be adding uh, some information as it pertains to the legal aspect of this discussion. Um, so I will do that as the uh, presentation proceeds. And Virginia is going to kick some things off, and we're going to get started. So, Virginia, can you tell us some of the dynamics of being married to a narcissist? Um, well, first I want to talk a little bit about what what a narcissist is like. Um, so the, the key trait is a lack of empathy. Um, they really see other people as extensions of themselves. So um, what they need and what they feel and what they want, they feel that other people should want that too. So as long as you want what they want, you're terrific. Um, the minute you don't want what they want or you have a need that doesn't jive with theirs, you're devalued. Um, and often that looks like ridicule, contempt, uh, oh, you're too sensitive, that kind of thing. So along with the lack of empathy goes um, kind of an exploitive uh, pattern of behavior. So other people are there to serve your needs. Um, and then there's kind of general grandiosity. Um, narcissists are terribly afraid of being inferior, so they present themselves as if they're sort of larger than life and everything to do with them is sort of the best. Um, and um, so, you know, to, to be with somebody like that over the long haul can lead to depression, it can lead to um, anxiety because you're continually invalidated. Um, uh, so, um, so for instance, let's say that you are, um, out at, at event with your narcissist spouse. So this might look like, um, they sort of talk you up in front of people and make it seem like they're going to do all these great things for you. Maybe they're really affectionate. And then you get home away from the audience and it's sort of like you're in, you're in car, invisible. Um, and, uh, um, excuse me, my, my phone just rang there. Um, and, uh, so you might, you might bring this up to your narcissist, like, Hey, you know, I, it's 
the way you're treating me is sort of confusing and I feel like um, you only kind of want me when it's good for you or, you know, I sort of feel like you're treating me like the help and this, was, this isn't working for me. And so their response, instead of being, oh, wow, I'm sorry that what I did hurt you, um, it's like you've hurt them, like, you know, what? Like, I do all these great things for you. And um, I, uh, you know, I, what you're saying is is just like, it's it's not true, or you're too sensitive. So they're, they try to control um, what you think and, and you feel, and they can be kind of very combative. They're not sorry. Um, you know, again, it's like you did something to hurt me. Um, and so what, what this pattern of behavior is really like is it's, it's, it's called gaslighting, which means it's, um, it's an attempt to distort reality. And this can be very confusing, um, especially if you're with a narcissist who's more sort of on the abusive end and they isolate you. If you don't have other people that you can um, sort of get accurate reflections from, you might start to feel like, oh, I, you know, there is something wrong with me and I'm not uh, working hard enough to be this person's spouse. Um, so again, it can really lead over the long haul to feeling depressed, anxious, invalidated, you know, your self-worth is in the toilet, uh, not, not a good experience. So I think, so it's, I think helpful it's helpful to understand, understand you know, what you're what you're saying a, a narcissist actually is, because I can imagine that. You know, and I know from experience, many people come in and say, well, my spouse is a narcissist. You know, I think a lot of people think that in general, once they're going through a divorce, it's very difficult and maybe there are some controlling behaviors. But what would you say is is sort of that, you know, that takes it over the edge to say, no, we really are dealing with somebody that has a disorder right now and we're really going to have to take a different approach here. What would you say about that? Um, well, again, you know, narcissism exists on a spectrum. So it's the, you know, the level of, of behavior. So um, it, it could be a lot of bad mouthing, trying to poison other people against you, um, threats, a lot of threats. If you don't do this, I'm going to do that. I'm going to destroy you. Um, it could be, uh, you know, sort of behaviors like um, sort of diverting funds or, uh, you know, taking taking children, um, not uh, not having the children available for you to see them. Um, but basically, it, it looks like complete and utter devaluation, trying to sort of annihilate you, like you just, you don't exist, and I'm going to try to get rid of you because you're in my way. You are now in my way of leading um, the life that I want to lead. Okay, that definitely makes sense. I think that's helpful um, as we go on with this discussion. So, so when a spouse wants to tell this narcissistic spouse that they want a divorce, um, tell us what that looks like and, and your experience with that. Well, um, if you're the one to initiate the divorce, um, so, so remember the narcissist wants control. Um, so if you're the one to initiate the divorce, especially if they, you know, aren't, don't have an idea that it's happening, it's a huge loss of control. And it's not so much that they're losing you, it's that they're losing this image that they have. You know, perhaps they have an image of they, they want a certain uh, family life. So you're shattering that for them. So when they feel a lack of control, they become very manipulative um and um so the best way to kind of regain control is to uh punish with money and to punish by doing things with children so they'll often threaten to get full custody even if they don't want it because they know this is the way to hurt you um they can threaten you know you'll never get a dime you, you know, you'll, you'll starve. Um, it's, it's all about punishment. Um, and being that the marriage has sort of had this pattern, 
do you find when people come into you that spouse really believes these things that they're not going to get a dime because this spouse has controlled the situation so they're really creating pattern i know myself when i have a potential client come in or a current client you know the first thing i say to them is all right do not listen to your spouse that spouse that's a narcissist do not listen to them you now listen to me you listen to professionals you listen to your therapist because they truly believe that what this spouse is telling them is going to be their reality so it's really scary yeah and i i think it's important um to say at this point that a situation like this the, the sort of like a, an accumulation of trauma um, and so when people are traumatized, they have um, their nervous systems are in a constant state of hyper arousal and they see everything as a threat. And it's it's hard to interpret um, when your nervous system is in hyper arousal, what is actually a threat and what is not really like what could actually do you harm it and and what might not. Um, and so my guess is when people come into your office, you're seeing a lot of emotional reactivity because they can't accurately assess um, what realistically could do them harm. They're, they're perceiving everything as a crisis and a disaster. Um, so this is normal in, in these situations, but, um, and I'll get to this in a little later, but, um, but the spouses of narcissists really need to work on managing their emotional reactivity so that they can make clear decisions in divorce um, and also just be better able to handle it and be more available for, for children. Um, but back to, um, back to what we're talking about right now. Um, so, so the narcissist sees children as an extension of them. So they're not going to be the, the divorce person, um, that says let's let's put the children first um and i'm going to sort of bracket how i feel about my spouse um because i need to support their relationship with the children they're not going to do that um they're going to try to um sort of form an alliance with the children so that the children turn against you um so what you should do um, because you can't control the narcissist, um, is to try not to get into a pattern of revenge, bad mouthing, um, which is difficult because if you have a narcissist spouse who's really slandering you and just saying all these crazy things about you, you might want to bad mouth them back or, you know, talk to your kids about what's, what's wrong with the narcissist spouse. And you don't want to do that. Um, because that really puts kids in the middle and it's very toxic. So you can respond to what's being said and, um, straighten out, uh, a false allegation, but you don't want to slam the narcissist spouse in the process. You could say something like, uh, I don't know why mommy said what she said, but let, let me tell you what's true for me. Uh, and you want to leave the emotional charge out of your voice. Um, and what, what's really important in these situations is that you teach your children critical thinking skills and relationship skills. So children of a narcissist uh, parent are getting propaganda. They're getting sort of very black and white statements about who you are. And uh, this is just not, it's not uh, an appropriate way to think. It's not a mature way to think. And so part of your job as a parent is to teach your kid critical thinking skills, which is the ability to see different points of view and decide for yourself what you think is accurate. So in order to do that, you need to present your side of the story. Um, and then, and this is really important, what you should say is, if you have a problem with me or a question about me, please come to me directly. You know, don't go to mom or dad because the problem is between the two of us. It's not between you and mom or dad. So that's hugely important because you're teaching your child relationship skills 
um, you know, triangle situations and going behind one person's back to another to try to control a situation is really toxic. Um, so you want to help your child learn that relationship skill, which will also help get them out of, of the middle of the situation between you and your spouse. Um, so, uh, custody exchanges in public places is a really good idea because one thing narcissists do, um, in private is they can, uh, really stir up the conflict and, um, they can do this by coming into your house and sort of looking around or, um, being very intrusive and you want to protect your own space. Um, that'll help keep you safe. So there's no, in, um, and you, Robin, will know more about this certainly than I, but I'm sure in, in custody agreements, there's a way to specify that custody exchanges take place in school, for instance. That way, the child doesn't ever have to see the conflict, or not ever, but it lessens the opportunities for your child to see the conflict between you and your narcissist spouse at the custody exchanges take place at school. Um, and I know in extreme cases where do domestic violence is an issue, um, that sometimes the custody exchanges happen at police, sta uh, police stations. Um, but those are some, some of the kind of basic ways that you can help protect your children in this situation. Right. And, and to your point in terms of, you know, public location or just specifics about pick up and drop off, um, it's, it's really important in any type of um, agreement or court order that there be specifics as to pick up time, pick up location, because when you're dealing with a narcissist, they're always going to be looking for ways to control the situation. So if there's any ambiguity in an agreement or an order, they're going to use that to their advantage. And they're going to use that to control it in a way that makes sense for them or that gives them some sort of advantage in the situation. So um, I think that that's really important as well in terms of specifics. Um, right. So all of this information is really helpful for people to, to, to understand the situation that they're in and, this, and the situation that they are truly dealing with a narcissist. What does that mean? And what does it mean for my children? Um, so going forward, we come up with some strategies for getting through this divorce with this narcissist spouse. So, so let's talk about um, the first strategy if we can. Okay, um, accepting that your divorce will not be amicable. I think this is one of the biggest things that I help clients with. Um, and so generally in a marriage with a narcissist spouse, the non-narcissist is always pursuing the spouse um, for things they're not ever going to get because the narcissist isn't capable of them. So what that is, is respect, validation, being reasonable. Um, and it, it, it's sort of like, you know, running after the Holy Grail. It's just, it's this unattainable thing you're never going to get. But what happens is during the divorce process, this dynamic continues. So the non-narcissist spouse will think, God, if I just do or say the right thing, I can get my spouse to uh, to co-parent um, effectively, or I can get them to like calm down, or I can get them to be reasonable. And it just is not ever going to happen. Um, and it's a huge distraction. Um, it's emotionally draining. Um, and it, it's a fantasy. And I think that the media and even some therapists who don't really understand high conflict divorce or divorce from a narcissist can in, inadvertently, um, you know, convince people that that if they just do the right things, they can have an amicable divorce with this person, or that they can co-parent with this person. And it can really create a sense of shame for people who just that can't do it. And, um, and it, again, it's just a huge waste of energy to put into trying to co-parent with somebody who can't co-parent because they, just, they don't have the skills. It takes somebody who's reasonable to co-parent. It takes um, being able to see there's more ways to solve the problem than yours. It takes managing emotional reactivity. Um, so again, these are not qualities that a narcissist has. So the first thing to do, it's it's sort of accepting 
you know, if you're an alcoholic that you, that you can't drink, you have a drinking problem, you, you're not going to get better until you accept the truth. Um, so that's the first thing. The second way is um, that it is really helpful to educate yourself about narcissism. Um, and uh, because there are certain strategies you can use. Um, there's a lot of books, there's a lot of information on the internet, and I know that people find support this way, but I also wanna step in and say, um, there's so much information out there um, that I think if you kind of go on a binge of I'm going to educate, you know, read all the stuff about narcissism, it can almost be re-traumatizing because it can be scary or it can make you feel hopeless. So read just enough to get a clear understanding of what you're dealing with, but don't, you know, don't just be reading 24 seven or it'll just be overwhelming. Um, and it's really important to hire an attorney who understands high conflict divorce. Um, you, I don't wanna say it's impossible, but it, you are less likely to be able to mediate or have a collaborative divorce with a narcissist. Because again, those processes take skills that a narcissist doesn't have. It takes flexible thinking, it takes, um, you know, the ability to see that, oh, I guess there's another way to solve this problem. It takes managing extreme behaviors. It takes managing emotional reactivity. The narcissist cannot do that. So um, it's probably more likely that you're going to have to um, do a lot of negotiating, perhaps litigating, you might have to go to court. So you wanna know that you have an attorney who understands what you're dealing with and can um, take appropriate measures. Um, I think it's really important that people have emotional support during this process. And uh, when you, if you want to get therapy, which I would recommend, it's really important that when you interview potential therapists, you ask them what they know about high conflict divorce because most therapists work with divorce but a lot of them don't really understand the difference between divorce and high conflict divorce um so you want to ask them questions like uh you know have you worked with high conflict divorce what you know what do you think the difference is between that and a regular divorce um what do you know about parallel parenting which is um a paradigm that that is usually used in situations with a, with a narcissist. It means that you really have very separate rules. You limit the contact between the two of you because attempts to negotiate um, co-parenting situations are not going to work. So if, if there's a therapist who's really gonna push co-parenting in your situation, they're not the therapist for you because they're gonna be convincing you that you can do something that you can't do. Okay, so you did touch upon litigation. So it may be true uh, that litigation may be the only route to take uh, when divorcing a narcissist. Um, it is definitely a different situation um, than some other divorces that, that take place um, because of these controlling types of behaviors and because they're not flexible thinking and things like that. So litigation may be uh, an option that uh, may be a reality and going in front of a judge and you know presenting all the facts and the evidence to make sure that your interests and your children's interests are safeguarded. Um, there are other possibilities, but you have to know you have to know who you're going to and you just have to be careful on who you select to be the professional who's gonna help you. So there is mediation. Mediation typically does in fact save time and money. Um, it reduces some of the stress of having to go to court and be in front of a judge and take off from work and have uncertainties as to you know, the whole court process. 
Um, but you have to look, just, just as Virginia was saying, you have to look for an experienced family law attorney. You have to look for an experienced therapist who knows about these high conflicts. The same holds true for a mediator, if that's going to be um, a route that you consider. Um, this has to be somebody that has a highly structured process. It can't be, there's there's many media, mediators out there that are very good, that quarter size store just sit back in their chair and they shoot from the hip and you know they kind of take it as it goes and, and they help people resolve their cases. When you're dealing with a narcissist, that typically does not work because it's not structured. It doesn't give them any sense of having control over, over even the mediation process. Um, so this mediator has to be someone who sticks to an agenda, gives everybody very clear rules that they each have to comply with, um, and really control the mediation process. Um, that mediator should reduce as much face-to-face -face interaction as possible. Because um, we talked about some of the behaviors before, and this narcissist can still intimidate that that other spouse um, when there's face-to-face -face interactions. You know, it could be a look, it can be a, a certain comment that's going to trigger certain feelings and cause that other spouse, the non-narcissist, um, you know, to give in or cave when otherwise they shouldn't be doing that. Um, so there's a process called caucusing that a mediator can do and kind of bounce back and forth with, with the attorneys and um, the parties. And that is it's quite effective when you go to the right mediator. A mediator who knows how to deal with um, a narcissist and, and even giving them the sense uh, a little bit that they are in control of the mediation, but yet still getting to a conclusion and a resolution that makes sense for everybody. So that's definitely another option to consider as well. So moving on to, um, you, you raised this issue a little bit earlier, uh, Virginia, when we kind of got off topic and you had talked about um, remaining emotionally engaged and, and sort of taking different approaches. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, your narcissist spouse wants to control you um, and... They do this by um, keeping you emotionally engaged. So what this, so they know how to push your buttons. Um, and they do this with threats, they do this with insults, they do this with, you know, bad mouthing the kids, uh, bad mouthing you to the kids. Um, because it, it, it's also a way to sort of, for them to defend against um, the shame of a failed marriage. Um, so they're kind of addicted to these angry ways of behaving um, because if they know that they've hurt you, it makes them feel superior. Because remember, that's another quality they have. They don't ever want to feel inferior. Um, and the non-narcissist spouse, who's probably had this tendency of if I can just do or say the right thing, I can get um, my my spouse to have an amicable divorce. Um, you know, you're probably also wrapped up in in this sort of very unhealthy psychological entanglement. Um, and it's also hard because the narcissist is so condescending and insulting. You know, when we're attacked, that our initial response is we want to defend ourselves. But um, any kind of um, defense that you launch about yourself, presenting your side of the story, or you know, getting upset, um, it's just you are giving the narcissist opportunities to debate with you, and they have an endless drive to fight, and they can wear you out. So, um, and I, I, I see couples stay locked in this situation for a long time. Um, so it's really important strategically that you emotionally disengage. And one way to do this, because if it's been years of somebody sort of beating you down, beating your self-esteem down, um, you, you maybe have started to believe some of these things that the narcissist has said. So it's important to realize that the way they interpret reality is very distorted. Right? Because all the good is with them and all the bad is with you. So if you remember 
that their interpretation of reality is distorted, you might take things less personally. You might not be as wounded. It's sort of like trying to argue with a with a tantruming five year old. You know, you just you're not going to be able to talk sense to this person. So um, don't react. Don't show emotion because they'll perceive you as being weak and they'll just be more contemptuous and, and they'll know that they've hurt you. So they'll keep doing whatever it is. Um, so uh, I, I, one way, a big way the battles continue in these situations is through, and I'll talk about this more in a little bit, is through electronic communication. So texts, emails, really easy for a narcissist to act out and just you know, continually bombard you with these ridiculous vitriolic emails. So it's important if you get emails and texts like that, um, not to respond right away if you feel yourself getting activated because you don't ever want to uh, respond in a way that's just gonna keep the fight going. So stay calm, um, you know, if, if, the, if it's an email or a text that's upsetting you, don't respond right away. Go do something else and cool down. If you um, actually are face to face with the narcissist, um, you know, try not to say anything and just try to get out of the situation as quickly as possible. And that brings us to our next strategy, um, which I really like and I, I think is helpful in the context of any litigation or me mediation, which is adopt a just the facts ma'am approach. So talk to us about that. Um, well, the phrase just the facts ma'am came and I may date myself here, but there's an old TV show called Dragnet um, and it was about a detective, Jack Webb, who had this very dry demeanor. <clears throat> and so whenever he'd be uh, investigating um, a crime, he, uh, when he would talk to someone and that person maybe was getting upset or you know talking about things that really didn't have to do with the case, he would say, just the facts, ma'am. Um, so that's the approach that you wanna take with the narcissist. You wanna take out all emotion, anything extraneous to what absolutely needs to be communicated. And it's really helpful to think of yourself as a reporter. Um, so that means you don't share your feelings. You don't say, God forbid, don't say, when you said this, I felt that, because A, they don't understand empathy, and B, if you tell them that they upset you, they're just gonna keep doing it. Um, or they'll argue with you and say, well, you're wrong. Um, so, and you don't wanna do anything like give parenting advice. I see clients do that and it's very well intentioned and they do it because narcissists have certain deficits that make it hard for them to parent because they can't empathize. So don't, don't give parenting advice. You only want to communicate um, about logistics and finances. So logistics would be Johnny's science test is Monday. Sally's soccer practice tomorrow is canceled. Um, and, uh, you know, or you might have to say, pursuant to the court order, uh, you know, child support was due on the first, um, please send it. Um, and don't, don't, and you know, you're, you'll get this response back, which is incendiary. Just don't respond to to the emotion. Just stick to the facts. Don't get into a negotiation over email. Keep things very brief. Stick to information. Uh, keep your tone neutral um, because if you get into sarcasm, um, again, it's going to invite more conflict. And um, be firm. Be firm with your boundaries. Um, you know, if they're trying to get you to switch uh, timeshare weekends and it really isn't, just isn't a convenient thing for you to do, don't go back and forth. Say, no, uh, I, I hear that you want to switch weekends, but we're going to stick to the court order. Um, and, and don't, like I said, the final thing, don't just don't attempt to set this person straight and give them an epiphany because it's not going to happen. And, and to your point about electronic communications and, and just 
really sticking to the facts and, and not engaging in that sarcasm or back and forth, that's ultimately going to help someone if they do wind up in a courtroom setting. Uh, whether it be during the divorce or post-judgment and we're trying to enforce an order or there is some conflict about, you know, an issue relating to the child, um, you want to remain the most reasonable party in the eyes of the court. And we know that the, the narcissist is not reasonable to begin with, and they're, they're not going to be able to handle that you're just sticking to the facts, and they're probably going to be responding and shooting back and doing all these things just like you said, Virginia. So maintaining those records is really important from a legal standpoint um, to demonstrate the reasonable position um, going forward and ultimately succeeding on any kind of matter that you have in court. So that's really helpful. That brings us to our fifth strategy, keep firm boundaries. And you did touch upon this. Um, so if you can just expand a little bit about the boundaries, that would be great. Right. So going back to the key traits of the narcissist, because they don't they, they don't see a boundary between themselves and other people. Right. Because other people are an extension of them. Um, so. So they feel like they should be able to do whatever they want and um, other people's boundaries are just sort of in the way of them getting what they want. They feel extremely entitled, uh, you know, rules are for the little people. So they will try to uh, overrun, you know, steamroll your boundaries. So you have to be very vigilant about setting and maintaining your boundaries. Um, so what, what do I mean by this? So one tactic that a narcissist will use quite frequently is they will try to intrude on your custody time. They may call uh, your children or text your children multiple times a day. Um, they may tell the children that if there's a, a rule that you have that the kids don't like, uh, to call them and, you know, they'll uh, either get on the phone with you, the spouse, and tell you what, you know, your, your parenting is all wrong and threaten you, or they'll, you know, sort of team up with the kid to come up with ways to circumvent your rules. Um, they may want, try to go into your house when you don't want them there. Um, they may uh, not have the kids um, available for your visitation. Um, there's all kinds of ways that they will violate boundaries. Um, they may not want to pay child support. Uh, it just sort of goes on and on. So you need to um, continue to remind them of the boundary. So an example of this would be, and, and this is so common, it happens all the time, if, this, if the narcissist spouse is really intruding on your custody time, take the kids' phones. <laughs> the, the, this, um, you know, once a day contact is plenty. They just do not need access to the kids 24-7. So you may need to take your kids' phones. Um, or, uh, you know, the, your, the narcissist does not get to interrupt dinner time. They can talk to the kids after dinner. So, but be prepared that whenever you set a boundary with the narcissist, their initial reaction is going to be quite aggressive because they want to intimidate you, right? Because they want to control the situation. So you need to um, not act out of fear Remember that you're entitled to your boundaries because that's how you keep yourself safe and your children safe. Um, and just keep setting them. Um, and uh, a lot of times what happens is, is, is a narcissist will, will text or email or call. If you don't respond to me by 5 o'clock, I'm going to go to court. I'm going to do all this stuff. Um, and a lot of times those are empty threats because they – know how to push your buttons. Um, so unless something's really time sensitive, um, you know, your, your child uh, fell off their skateboard and broke their arm, you just, you probably don't need to respond right away. And it will start conditioning the narcissist that they, they just don't have 24-7 access to you. 
Um, and again, you want to stick to all parenting time plans. Um, you know, I want to get into a sort of back and forth war over, you know, if, if your narcissist spouse is messing with your parenting time, you don't want to do the same to get back at them. If there's, um, if, if the narcissist is violating the court order in terms of parenting, you are, I mean, you, you start out by emailing them according to the court order. Um, the kids are with me this weekend, you know, whatever it is. And if they're just continuing not to listen, then you most likely are going to need to contact your attorney um, and let your attorney deal with it. But you don't want to ignore violations of parenting time, uh, not paying child support. You, you just don't want to let that continue. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well, moving, moving a little, a little bit, bit uh, to some of the legal um, aspects of divorcing a narcissist, one of the really important things to know is that some of this behavior could actually rise to the level of domestic violence. It may cross the line into a situation where there's harassment, there may be stalking. Um, or some other form of violence uh, whereby you and or your children need protection. So certainly consult with an attorney, but if there's an emergent situation whereby you are in fear for your safety, your well-being, and that of your children, you can immediately contact the police if you believe that you are in some sort of harm's way, and um, you could obtain what's called a temporary restraining order. Temporary restraining order would provide some, obviously, temporary relief that would remove the um, violating spouse um, from the home, from the situation, and offer some protection until such time that there is a final restraining order hearing that gets scheduled, whereby um, everyone has an opportunity to present their facts and circumstances. Um, but, but understand that you do have rights to be protected, and if you believe that things are rising to a level um, that are you know, causing some safety concerns, you have that right to certainly be protected. Uh, another important thing is, as I was indicating before with regard to maintaining email records, maintaining text messages, document everything. Um, because again, if there's any ambiguity, just as I said, if there's ambigu ambiguity in an order or an agreement, that narcissist is gonna try to use that to their advantage and control the situation. So you wanna do as much as you can to make sure that the facts just like we said before, just the facts, ma'am, that the facts are well documented, whether that be um, in emails, text messages, um, some sort of diary that you may, may maintain, um, some calendaring that you may maintain, something like that, so that um, if need be, that can be presented um, to a court or another professional. So when you're working with an attorney, Virginia indicated before, you want to find an attorney who is experienced in high conflict matters. That's somebody that's gonna be ready, willing, and able to go to court if that's the end result. Um, certainly you want an attorney who wants to try to help you resolve your case if they can through mediation or through collaborative divorce if that is a situation that um, is possible. But you also want somebody that's going to be your voice and who's going to stand up for you and uh, stand up to this narcissist and make sure that um, they're advocating for you and your children. So this person needs to be skilled in a courtroom and they need to be skilled in mediation. Mediation doesn't mean just talking about things and you know uh, just doing whatever this narcissist wants. It's, it's a craft and it's uh, you know a situation where um, the attorney is doing what's right for you and your children and getting you the best outcome. Because ultimately, the attorney's there to help guide you. You're ultimately the one making the decisions, but the attorney needs to understand that the um, other spouse is a narcissist so that we and attorneys um, can strategize in different ways and we can be your voice because oftentimes that's what you need because this person has controlled and taken your voice away for so many years and you will build that back up but initially um, that's what an attorney is there to do for you so you definitely want to find somebody who has experience with that that concludes our presentation uh, I want to thank you Virginia for 
all of the information that you provided it is certainly helpful and um, all of the tips that you've provided I think are going to help people through this you know unfortunate uh, set of circumstances but understanding and everything that you talked about understanding that is key so I, I really want to thank you for that and we appreciate everything you have to offer oh thank you thank you for having me on Robin okay. and if anyone has any questions um, um, you can certainly schedule a consultation a free consultation with any of the lawyers at uh, the Weinberger Law Group um, and you can contact the firm at 888-888-0919 and we thank you for taking the time to watch and listen to the information and we are here to help thank you so much